The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Deathbed Conversions. As I was thinking about today's topic on deathbed conversions, I immediately go to the biblical story about Saul, who becomes Paul. He has the road to Damascus experience where he supposedly meets the risen Jesus uh, who basically comes after him for persecuting Christians. And then Saul, you know, is transformed, becomes Paul and goes on to live his life and, and becomes basically the founder of modern Christianity, the author of a good chunk of the New Testament. Wow, that's, that's impressive that somebody, somebody had an experience and it so dramatically changed their life that they now become an ambassador for it. This is such a compelling uh, story of, of, you know, go back to a Christmas Carol when you have Scrooge who has this transformative experience and goes from being a terrible reprobate to, you know, oh, the jolly good Mr. Scrooge who's, you know, loves everybody and everything else. Those sorts of stories are inspiring. But it's curious to me that we find um, people on behalf of their religion trying to bolster it, not with evidence that it's true, arguments that we should believe uh, based on sound evidence, but by appealing to its popularity. And not just a fallacious appeal to popularity in the sense of everybody believes this, therefore you should too, but in the sense that this important person believes it. This potential, this historical figure here uh, was very religious. You know, Isaac Newton, he was religious. Yes, and he spent a lot of time on alchemy trying to turn base metals into gold. Why do we do this? Well, one of the things that's come up on the show several times in the past is the, these appeals to individuals like Einstein, who are generally viewed as some of the smartest people who've ever lived. And someone will say, well, you don't think you're smarter than Einstein, do you? Uh, trying to play on your humility, that you would never be arrogant enough to say that you are, in fact, smarter than Einstein. Um, I, I have flatly said before that, yes, on the subject of God, I may in fact be smarter than Einstein, uh, depending on the conclusion we reach. That doesn't tell you anything at all about whether I'm smarter in another category or in any other category. And, it, and it's not even necessarily an issue of being smarter. It's one of those things where I think this person was wrong, irrespective of how smart they were. And I think I'm right, irrespective of how smart you don't think I am. But what we hear a lot with the deathbed conversions are things like uh, Charles Darwin is probably one of the most famous dubious accounts of someone changing uh, and adopting or readopting a religious view on their deathbed. Now the thing is, we have no way to verify this. Um, there are people who will dispute the claim. There are people who believe it. There are certainly accounts of people. Uh, we have good reason to think that there are people who have had a deathbed conversion or some sort of conversion very late in life, you know, with the prospect of death looming. And while some of them are certainly real, none of them are relevant. It, it doesn't matter whether somebody had these experiences or not. You take a look at what they've tried to do with Christopher Hitchens, you know, claiming that he had some sort of experience. Even if he did, um, it doesn't matter. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Isaac Newton, pick whoever your, you know, individual of awe is, the fact that they converted um, is independent from what their reasons were for converting. And it's the reasons that matter. It's the, re it's the only reason that matters. So if they pick a prominent figure and say, ah, don't you know, so-and-so had a deathbed conversion, for me, the best answer is, so what? Well, what does that tell us about whether or not the proposition is true? Uh, and I'm not even necessarily convinced that your story is true. How would we go about verifying that this person had a deathbed conversion? And in the end, even if we verify it, it doesn't matter. So why would we spend time on it? This is one of the neater, I guess, uh, tools for people who are trying to proselytize by saying things like, you know, do you hold yourself, do you hold your own values in higher esteem than you do these other people? And I don't really see a problem with occasionally or even frequently saying yes to that. But there's a second problem with these deathbed conversions that have nothing to do with the notion of appealing to famous people uh, and what they've decided under certain circumstances. Let's take a look at that. So a curious thing about deathbed conversions for me is what it tells us about the religion in question. Predominantly, this is a, a Christianity thing. Uh, I'm sure that 
somewhere out there, there are other religions where people have had deathbed conversions. Um, it, it's really the sort of thing that lends itself mostly to this notion of Christianity, that one can give oneself over and, and be saved. And the problem here is that you have incidents where people on death row, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and others, have converted to Christianity. We, there's clearly some motivation there. Maybe you're trying to convince a parole board, whatever, but we don't have the ability to get in people's minds and figure out whether or not this is a sincere conversion uh, or whether they're just pretending. But let's assume that they're sincere. What does that sort of conversion tell us about Christianity in particular? This notion that you could live an absolutely horrific and terrible life, slaughtering innocent people, stealing, uh, engaging in all sorts of things that Christianity would hold as repugnant under you know, normative situations. And yet at the very last minute, you can say, you know what? I, I was wrong. I surrender to you. I, I recognize that Jesus died for my sins and, and I accept this. I accept you into my heart and I, I will change my life from here on out. What does that tell us about the model that you can be an absolutely terrible person and have this sort of deathbed conversion and potentially become saved? I've had friends before have noted that, you know, this is like pointing out that, uh, you know, Hitler advocating for his own Catholicism uh, under some model would be in heaven while Anne Frank would be in hell because she was Jewish and non-Christian and that there may be other plenty of other people uh, in the secular community who live lives where they are donating their time and putting forth every effort to make the world a better place. One of my co-hosts on the show, Phil Session, uh, he constantly, we can't give him enough awards. He volunteers more than anybody, uh, and he volunteers in every respect. He's working on the RAMP project, uh, uh, humanists helping the homeless, atheists, uh, atheists helping the homeless, humans at work, countless other, and there's, there's too many things that he does. Now you're saying in, in this model of Christianity that this person who's devoted such a massive portion of their life to helping others, to doing the sort of things that um, the whitewashing of Jesus would encourage people to do, you know, sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. We know Christians by and large don't do that. Uh, I don't know too many people who are now in, in poverty because they gave away everything they had to people who were also impoverished, but it would seem that you would reach a, a kind of a socialist balancing act there. But the notion that Phil would be in hell while somebody else could be a terrible person their entire life and then at the last moment engage in this sort of deathbed conversion and then get to go to heaven, I, I don't see how you can hold that up as, as, a, as a paragon of virtue, as a system that is something that we would look at as good or that should inspire people at all. So we appealed, or Christian apologists will appeal, to deathbed conversions. Uh, in the cases of philosophers, they've tried it with Hitchens. They, they did it rather convincingly with Antony Flew, because Antony Flew was a prominent British philosopher and atheist, outspoken. And late in life, um, when he was, by most reasonable accounts, uh, slightly addled in his thinking, he was sort of taken advantage of by some theistic apologist who convinced him uh, of a version of the argument from design. Now, through discussions, he never, uh, or, or he repeatedly acknowledged that he doesn't in fact believe in a personal God and didn't give over to Jesus. He just became convinced of this particular version of an argument from design, which he also recognized there were flaws with it. So you've got somebody who's late in life and probably clearly not thinking as clearly as they once did. That, to me, gets to the heart of the key problem with appealing to deathbed conversions, and that's this. What does it say about an idea if it is most convincing and most compelling early in life before you've developed critical thinking skills late in life after you've potentially had those critical thinking skills damaged and at significant points in people's life when creative critical thinking skills get thrown out the window the whole atheists in foxholes or i was a drug addict and desperately needed help none of these are arguments that are based on evidence and reason they're not arguments that should convince people they are all fallacious emotional appeals now if some of the best 
arguments you can come up with for your idea are only convincing to those people who either ha don't have or have lost or have impaired critical thinking fa faculties. What does it say about your idea? Why on earth would we ever uh, give any credence to this? At the end of the day, if somebody comes up and says to me, you know, so-and-so had a deathbed conversion, my reply is normally, so? Or, and? Uh, exactly what is it you're trying to say? Somebody had a deathbed conversion. What does it tell us about the truth of the proposition? Absolutely nothing. But it tells us a great deal about who we are as people, about how we will desperately flail about when we don't have a reasonable explanation. And it's the individuals that they're citing who may have had deathbed conversions. Um, I, I, I don't pity them. This is life. This is what happens to human beings. And we make mistakes. We're not perfect thinkers. The people that I pity are the ones who look at those examples and fail to see this problem and then hold those examples up as if those are good reasons to believe. And so if you ever hear that I had a deathbed conversion, you shouldn't care. If I have a conversion that is based on sound argument, that's based on reason and evidence, that is something that I think should be convincing to me and potentially to others, I will do my best to post a video about it. And if I manage to die sometime between the conversion and posting a video, then you should point out that whatever this God is that gave me some revelation, uh, he didn't care enough about anybody else to allow me the time to actually record the video. I could end up uh, losing my ability to think critically and reasonably at any time. Not just at my deathbed, but in a moment of desperation of some sort. If you hear that I've made a deathbed conversion, I, I think the only answer is, so what? Why should anybody care that Matt at some point believed in God? Didn't he believe in God years and years ago when, when he was a young man as well? Yes. Yes, he did. We'll see you next time. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.